So far, we've only explored the features and functions of the interface that are permanently presented on the main screen. However, there are many other features that can be accessed through pop-up windows. Let's begin with the help window that can be opened by clicking on the question mark icon in the upper right of the screen. This window lists all of the keyboard shortcuts used by the interface. On the right side, we see shortcuts to a variety of functions, such as turning off the track power by hitting the space bar, or increasing and decreasing the throttle with the up and down arrow keys. In fact, we've already discussed each of the function shortcuts with one exception, the C key. This key is used to toggle the current meter on and off. When off, the current meter turns red and will no longer be updating. This mode is only used in conjunction with some other diagnostic windows, and in general, you'll always want to keep the meter on. On the left side of the help screen, we see a list of shortcuts that open and close a variety of pop-up windows, providing access to the remaining features of the DCC++ interface. The first shortcut listed is a lowercase h, which opens and closes the window itself. Hit h once, and the help window closes. Hit it again, and the help window reappears. You can also close any window by clicking on the small x in the upper right corner. In addition, though you cannot resize pop-up windows, you can reposition them by dragging on the top bar. Once moved, the interface will remember the new position, even if the window is closed, and then reopen. Now let's go through each of the other pop-up windows. Hitting a lowercase a brings up the accessory window. To avoid cluttering the screen, I'll close the help window for now. As you probably know, DCC signals can control decoders in engines as well as stationary decoders used to operate accessories such as turnout motors or switches. DCC++ adheres to the complete NMRA specifications for DCC signals, which, for accessories, provides up to 512 main addresses and four sub-addresses as shown. This allows you to control up to 2048 individual accessories. For example, on my layout, this turnout is hooked up to a lens accessory decoder set for address number one and sub-address zero. If I enter two, those two values into the address boxes, I can then operate the turnout directly through the accessory control window. However, this is not recommended during normal operation since the interface will not update when you take manual control. And who wants to remember all of these addresses anyway? The whole point of the DCC++ interface is that you set the addresses once and forget them. Instead, the main purpose of this accessory window is to help configure and test new stationary DCC decoders, as well as to program their initial addresses and sub-addresses. Let's now close the accessory control window and reopen the help window to see what else we need to cover. One of the more important functions of any DCC system is the ability to program the mobile DCC decoders embedded in each engine. DCC++ makes that easy through two separate windows. One allows for programming on the main operations track, and that can be opened with the lowercase o. The other allows for programming on the so-called programming track, and that could be opened with the lowercase p. Programming on the operations track is a bit easier, so we'll start with that. Trains running on the main track should already have had their cab addresses set, so you can simply type in the appropriate cab number here. As you see, it already indicates cab 6021. You then select the CV you want to update. I am going to select CV105, which NMRA specifications reserve for customer storage. 
This is a good thing to use for testing since it has no effect on the operation of the engine itself. As you know, CVs or configuration variables generally store a single byte or 8 bits of information. To write an entire byte, specify it here either hexadecimal notation, decimal notation, or in binary notation. Once you specify the value in one notation, hit the return key and the same value will be displayed in all three notations. For example, if I enter 160 into the decimal box and hit return, the window shows the equivalent in hex as A0 and in binary as 10100000. You can also use the tab key to cycle through each of the selection boxes, which are then synchronized automatically if you change any of their values. For example, if I modify the binary value by changing the last 0 to a 1 and hit the tab key, the hex and decimal values are updated to A1 and 161 accordingly. Once you have specified your value, simply hit the right button to now program the decoder. The button briefly flashes, indicating the appropriate DCC signal was sent to the tracks. The decimal number 161 should now be stored in CV105 of CAB6021. Sometimes you don't want to send a new value to a specific CV. You only want to set or clear a specific bit. NMRA standards allow this important function, and therefore, so does the DCC++ interface. To accomplish this, you specify the cab number in CV just as before, but instead of entering a hex, decimal, or binary value, you select which bit number in that CV you want to control. For example, if I want to clear bit number 5, I type in a 5, and then I hit the clear button. If my math is correct, this should change the value stored in CV105 of cab 6021 from the decimal number 161 to a decimal number of 129. Note that the set and clear buttons flash once when you click them to indicate the DCC signal was sent to the tracks. The nice thing about programming train decoders on the main operations track is that you can do that at any time even when a train is running. However, basic standard NMRA protocols do not provide a method of reading CV values from trains while they are on the operating track. Also, if you don't know the cab address of a train, you can't specify which decoder you want to program. These limitations are solved by the use of a dedicated programming track that is electrically isolated from the main track and uses a separate channel for DCC signals. DCC++ fully supports this type of programming via the programming track window. On my particular layout, I use one of the sidings as a programming track by isolating it with non-conductive track connectors. I also have a relay that switches the feed lines coming into the siding from the main power signals used across the rest of the layout to dedicated programming track signals. To operate this relay, I simply hit the programming track button at the top of the track window. When lit, the siding is isolated from the rest of the layout and can be used for programming. When dimmed, the relay switches the siding back to the main track power so it can be used for normal operations. Programming a CV on the programming track is somewhat similar to how we did it on the main operations track, except that in this case, there is no place to specify the cab address. It does not matter what the cab address of the engine to be programmed is set to. As long as it's on the programming track, it's going to be programmed. And of course, this means that there should be only one engine on the programming track at any one time. As before, you specify the number of the CV to program. Let's use CV106 this time. Which is also reserved for customer storage and won't affect the operation of the train. Also, as before, you can specify the value to be written into the CV in hex, decimal, or binary notation. Let's enter the hexadecimal value 5f, which is 95 in decimal. Once specified, simply hit the right button, which flashes to confirm the signal was sent. 
A status message at the top of the screen also indicates whether the write was successful. In addition to writing new values to CVs, you can also read current values of CVs for engines on the programming track. Let's enter CV 105 and hit the read button to see if it really does indeed contain the number 129 as we expected from programming it a few moments ago using the operations window. Voila, CV 105 does indeed contain decimal number 129, just as expected. Now let's go back and check CV 106, which we had just programmed with the hex value 5F. And indeed, it contains the hex value 5F, decimal value 95, just as we had programmed. The other main purpose of programming decoders using a programming track is to read and write cab addresses, especially if you just bought a new decoder and want to change its default address from 3 to something that actually matches the number board on your engine. Since NMRA standards allow for two types of addresses, so-called short addresses and long addresses, DCC++ supports both types. To read the address of an engine, simply hit the read button. The interface will update to show the engine's short address as well as its long address. As expected, the long address of the engine on the programming track is 6021, and the decoder itself is set to respond to long addresses rather than the short address, which will otherwise be ignored. To change either the long address or short address, simply type in a new value and hit the write button. To program the decoder to switch between responding to the long address and the short address, use the long address and short address buttons. Once I'm finished with all of my programming, I need to remember to hit the programming track button at the top before I close the programming window so that the siding can be used for normal operations once again. I have tested both reading and writing on the programming track with eight different decoders, including two with sound cards by different manufacturers, and so far have not found a decoder that cannot be successfully programmed. Developing code that is robust enough to handle all of these different types of decoders was the second most difficult aspect of creating the DCC++ system itself. Ironically, the first most difficult aspect of the DCC++ system was actually producing these videos.